on my side and this morning your end. Um, I always say when I talk, I try and do three things. It's like coaching. Um, I try and educate a bit. Uh, if I can, I try to inspirate a bit and I try to entertain. And they're the three elements that I always, I always believe are important when you talk. So uh, hopefully I can achieve that. Um, so building a coaching world and, uh, and learning and relearning in, in coaching is, is the topic. And uh, I hope it's an enjoyable night. I hope we get something for it. Uh, I'm not uh, naive enough to think that I'm the smartest person on the line or no more uh, than anyone here. I'm sure there's many more. So I come here uh, to serve as best I can and hopefully can pull something out of it. Um, so this is what today or tonight, this morning fee looks like an introduction, 10 minutes. Uh, we go into this uh, framework that I created for coaching uh, for about 60. We might split halfway through and then we might have questions and, uh, and that's kind of it. So, so this is me. I am from the west of Ireland, a place called Galway. I'm born and bred there. My background is in teaching. I thought I, 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 I'm transitioning out of teaching into full-time coach development. I taught for 15 years in primary school and, and I, I enjoyed it uh, deeply. And I learned an awful lot about coaching and um, from teaching. Teaching and coaching are quite similar. I am a coach. Our games are called Gaelic games, hurling and, and Gaelic football. Uh, the GAA, it's the largest volunteer organization in the world. And uh, I'm a coach developer uh, working across a lot of sports. Um, I think about 15 sports at this stage I've worked across. Um, and I mentor coaches. I, I facilitate coaches. I work with coaching teams in the background. And I work an awful lot with clubs and creating learning environments for, 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 for the coach, which in turn go, go on to create a learning environment for a player. And I am what is phrased as a generalist. I don't have any big PhDs or fancy letters or things like that. Um, I know a broad range of things and I try and simplify things down and make them easy to understand and execute. Uh, simplicity is the highest form of complexity. Uh, I created a framework called the Carver Framework, which we're going to go through tonight. And I've written books and uh, I continue to write books. And uh, yeah. Um, I've written two books and I've one or two coming in the near future. So that's that's kind of me. So what I know for sure, and this is still the introduction, but this is how I frame things. Uh, Oprah Winfrey asked this question of her guests, and she also wrote a book, What I Know For Sure, and she broke down uh, everything into different categories. And she wrote, What I Know For Sure, and I think it's a great question to start anywhere with. And if we get really simple or really clear on what we know for sure, but from that simplicity, we can we can pull an awful lot. So I have 20 things I know for sure, and I'm going to go through them. And then I'm going to try and dovetail everything through as we talk. I know Einstein was one of the sim one of the most intelligent men in the world, and he said everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. So we're trying to, coaching is about giving simple messages to people. But just, we can't be too simple. We cannot oversimplify. So simple, but no simpler. I know that my legacy in coaching will be measured by how I served others. Coaching is servant practice, there to help others. I know that John Wooden, because he, John Wooden, told us that we don't have to like them all, but you have to love them all. In the, in the holy book, or, there is a thing that says, uh, if love won't work, nothing will. So I don't really have to like them all, but I have to love them all. I know consistency. John C. Maxwell talked about the law of consistency. Consistency is really important. We'll get a specific adaptation if we can demand, uh, impose demands consistently uh, and intelligently. So I know about the law of consistency. I know coaching is not playing from the sideline. A great mentor of mine said they go to the pitch to learn to think for themselves. So coaching is not playing the game from the sideline. I know that the human spirit is an unknowable force of energy. So we can never dehumanize environments. You might get a, a sharp improvement, but it'll, you'll get an underreaction. So coaching and creating an environment is full of human spirit. It's, and then when we blend that together, it creates great energy. And it's, 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 it's an unknowable force. I know that words create images and images create actions. So the articulation of the coach is really important. Fern Gambetta gave me that quote. He's a, he's a mentor of mine. Words create images and images create actions. So how we articulate is really important. Um, I know what we learn to do, we learn by doing badly. So do we want to look good or learn? 
the learning. Uh, I have a nephew called Luke, and Luke is seven years old. And when he kicks the ball and he's right, it looks great. Yeah, it looks really, really good. When he kicks it on his on his left, it looks really, really bad. So he has two options. Does he want to look good or does he want to learn? Because what we learn to do, we learn by doing badly first. And I think that's a critical thing that the learner needs to understand. This looks bad before it looks good. I know in developmental coaching, we can never rush the performance. Our job as coaches is to give the, the, the player the capacities to access the game at a high, le high level long term. So we can't just rush to performance. I know the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing be consistent with it and nail it and simplify it. I know that, uh, I know that uh, the greatest threat to excellence is talent. You have to challenge them all, the weak, the strong, the talented. Yeah, they, they're the, 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 the threat to excellence is talent. So a coach is a big job there. I know the coaching is about influence as opposed to authority. People don't listen. Over time, they observe. They observe the coach. Is he a learner or is she a learner? Uh, they observe, they don't listen over time, they, they observe and they learn from observation. Uh, you're gone in behind my screen here for that one, so I need to figure that one out. So then too, yeah. I know once we get uh, once we get coaching right, everyone has a chance, yeah. Good coaching gives everyone a chance. And I know the environment drives behavior. If we create the proper environment, the behaviors follow. So T.S. Eliot wrote, the greatest ages do not contain more talent, but they waste less. I know if we want students of the game, we have to be something of a professor of the game, the light and shade of the game to show them the detail in the game. I know that if I want to be, if I want students, I need to be something of a professor. I know the structure delivers great function. I know a lack of structure and dysfunction. I know if I get angry, I blame or complain. I'm, I'm bet, defeated. A, B and C is D. I know simplicity yields complexity. We do simple things better. I know unity is everything. In unity, there is strength. And I definitely know the best is yet to come. So there are 20 things I know for sure. I know these things for sure. And from this, I go off and I, I will practice my coaching. So from that bank, and I suppose the first challenge for us all as coaches is to really know what we know for sure. And then use that to guide us. So that's just a brief introduction to me and, and where I'm coming from with this. So for me, my definition of coaching is raising awareness. Now, I think the player has three awarenesses and we'll spend the evening looking at this. The three awarenesses of the player is self-aware player. We want off-game awareness and we want in-game awareness. And they're the three awarenesses I'll keep talking about. Self-aware player, off-game awareness and in-game awareness. And how we raise them awareness will be how we challenge them and how we assist them. Some people are really good at challenging and they're not so good at assisting. Some people aren't that great at challenging. So that's my definition of coaching. And, and, and that's how I look at it. And I think everyone should have their own definition of it. So I saw this, um, I read this, words create images and images create actions. Well, I read this a long time ago and uh, it led me to create a coaching framework from it. Michelangelo said of the angel David, he said, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. And that's, that, that, that concept spoke to me a lot. Um, because here we have raw material and we have a craftsperson, Michelangelo. And, they have the, he, and he has the ability to see things for what they could be, yeah? to see potential in raw materials. But he also has this, the skills and the tools to draw it out. So my background, as I said before, is, is education. So the Latin word for education is educare, which means to draw out, yeah? So coaching is just about getting the best out of people, yeah? And in order to do that, we need to have the ability or the lenses or the perspective to see things for what they could be, if we have the tools and the skills. So that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. That led me to create a, a coaching framework, which was called the Carver Framework, which had six elements, connection, awareness, research, values and visions, endorsing and reflection. And it was a cycle of coaching improvement, which was building and rebuilding a coaching world. And I use this framework in, in a lot of different areas, in sport and in industry and, and, and different stuff. But uh, 
the principles of the principles of the principles. So I'm going to spend the next while um, walking through the framework. And um, I think, I'm not so sure is there anything new. I don't think there's anything really new anyways, but it's perspective and how we look at things. And hopefully you will see certain things that, that, that you will find interesting and the whole bigger picture of the story will, will appear to you. So Brené Brown is one of the world's researchers on courage and bravery, and also things like shame and vulnerability. She says, connection is why we're here. We're hardwired to connect with others. It gives purpose and meaning and without it, they're suffering. So if we take that concept of connection and we ask ourselves as coaches, what are the connections we need to make? And to me, there's probably five real principal ones. The first connection, it has to be with the player. People love to be treated as individuals. And if they're coming to you at eight, nine, it's just know their name, it's have fun, it's ask questions. And then as they go older uh, and we get to maybe 12, 13, we can start using tools and different ways to, to, to build that connection with the player. Now, an analogy I, I, I use with coaching is it's, it's, it's a, like a rope. Every interaction we come, it's like a thread. So every interaction we have with the player, we're trying to layer thread on top of thread on top of thread until we have a rope that's big, fat and strong, and then we can stretch it. Because ultimately, coaching is about taking people out of their comfort zone. Now, if we look at coaching and the craft, we look at tools of the craft person. So up on the top left, everywhere you see me with tools, and that's it. And that's, that's what I'm on about, the, the tools of the craft person. So simple tool on connection is all those questionnaires, simple stuff, get to know the player, get insights, try and accelerate that understanding, learn the learner. So I just give you sample questions that I would put into questionnaires for 13, 14 year olds and um, different things. The principle is the same, get to know the player, maybe use a tool that will accelerate that. So these are just simple stuff that I would have pulled out out of bigger questionnaires would have done. Do you love and enjoy the game? Get an insight into that. Do you love and enjoy being part of the group? Are you confident in your ability? Now at this stage of my life, I've done thousands of questionnaires with players. And the common denominator is that they're not confident in their ability. And when they're not confident in their ability, they don't do what's, need, what's necessary to do to get to the level, next level because they kind of don't believe it. So I'm, I'm always amazed at that lack of confidence. And it's a great insight for me with the player. Are you a good teammate? Is a great question. Yeah, coaching is about raising awareness. These are other questions you could. I use different tools with different players at different ages. Why do you play? Connect them to their why. How interested are you reaching your potential? That's really important. If they are six out of 10, the job as coach hopefully is to get them to seven or eight out of 10. If they're 10 out of 10, you know, we can really test that. But if they're five out of 10 interested in reaching their potential at the minute, and we've got a lot of pressure there, that's, that's, that's going to break. So we need to treat them differently coach the individual, coach the individual. Everyone likes to be treated as an individual. So then rate yourself physically, technically, mentally, lifestyle, and as a teammate, and give them that language. And that will give us insights. How open-minded, coachable, and willing to learn it. Again, raise their awareness, ask some questions. When do you play at your best? So just as an overview, that first connection is to the player. And the simple message there, connect with the individual, learn the learner, get to know them. There's a great folk song here in Ireland called The Voyage. And it says together, there is a line and it says together we're in a relationship. If we built it with care, it will last the whole trip. So the next next, next connection is the player to the player of the team. You know, Wooden used to say, we are many, but are we much? And my mantra is always in unity, there are strengths. So how can we foster that unity? And how can we teach teamship? And, and, and ferocious togetherness is a phrase. Words are important, you know? Words create images. So we want a really unified team. So we need to be very purposeful in building that connection between them. And I'm just gonna show you three little steps I've taken with my team who are currently under 16 over the last three years. I've been with them for the last three years. And I'll just show you, uh, you know, how, how we went around building that or teaching that teamship. So in year one, we wanted to try and get them to self-manage a small little bit, right? 
So at this at this stage they were um they were 14, under 14, so 13. So we would have created a team charter and I'll show you it really simply. So we've got them in little groups. Again, coaching is about drawing out, it's about getting out of people, pulling the best out of people, using tools. So we would say we put them into little groups and they had to come up with a motto for the year. What would the motto look like in action? What would success look like for the team? What they want from management? What was not acceptable from the management? And what did they want the management to say about them at the end of the year? And that was maybe five or six different groups. And then we fed that in with a steering group and they came up with this. So this was their kind of their player charter for the year. The phrase was, we have to work in order to be strong. And the way they, the success would look like competition for places and different things. And then in year two, when we had them, we we're trying to, I suppose, bring them to the next level and, and teach them more about teamship. So sometimes it's about challenging and sometimes it's about assisting. So we would in, I, I suppose, we kind of got these concepts from Anson Dorrance and, and, and different coaches all over the world, but we put in 15 foundation stones of team and we taught that a lot. And, and we tried to focus an awful lot on that, our language of it. So these were things I've been working on all my life with it really. So these were our foundation stones, the unity. And we had a little phrase around everything, right? These are examples, effort is the currency. Hard work and isn't easy and good hurlers aren't lazy. We play hurling, that's our game. Fun enjoyment, we do this for fun. S preparation, deliver success. Lifestyle, there are choices you have to make. You can have anything you want, but you can't have everything. Relentlessness is another a value we're trying to push through. Competitiveness, we came up with, we are the hunters, never the hunted. And inquisitiveness, the seeker becomes the, found, the finder. So these were cornerstones of what we try to build a teamship and connect the players around these concepts. And then over the, 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 the lockdown period, this is our year three of teamship. What we would have done is um, we're trying to get them to self-manage again and bring it to the next level of self-management. So they had projects where they had to research. They were split into six teams and they had to research different teams. They could pick any team they want. Some picked Apple, Tesla, Chicago Bulls, different teams. And they had to compare our team to their team and the values and qualities and the content. I was never, I'm, I'm involved in coaching. I think it's like 22 years now. I was never proud of, of what they came out with. Six teams brought through six projects, comparing our teams to, to these great teams. And now what they're doing at the minute is independently, they're mining down to create five values for our team going forward for this year. So that unity in the team and that teaching teamship and that connection of player to player is massive. It's everything. As Wooden said, we are many, but are we much? The third connection I think a coach must make is to connect the player to the game. I read a phrase on a wall, stuck on a wall one day on a poster after a coaching uh, conference and it said, the qualities of a great coach was the question. And one of them said, he made us students of the game. And I thought, wow, isn't that a powerful thing? The coach's role is to connect the player to the game, show them the beauty in the game, the light and the shade and the detail and the precision, like the picture Benjamin has of Maradona sitting looking, yeah, connect them to the game, words, images, yeah, connect them to the club, see the picture there of Ben, connect them to the club, now we're a bit different here, we play locally, we pay for where we're from, so we're always trying to connect the player to the club and to their future, to connect the player to the future in the game and the club is everything it's really inspiring so you're painting a picture of in five years time in two years time yeah the coach is professor yeah i think it's really an important concept love of the game to try and engender that the fourth connection i think we need to make and again this is all con context specific and um, but with us we largely have volunteer coaches and we get anyone that can help us yeah, so that coaching team connection is everything. And I work a lot in this area with coaches and everything uh, 
different coaching teams in the background to try and create that connection. And this is how we do it, how we've done it in my management team. And, and um, again, I go back to together we're in a relationship. If we build it, we'll care, it'll last the whole trip. So these might be sample questions you might use at the beginning of the year with your coaches. And again, I don't know how many you have. I'm a big believer in coach recruitment and help recruitment and different people. But anyways, these are questions. Again, up here, we go to the tradesman tool, tools. Questions are tools, questionnaires are tools. You know, trying to get to the truth. What do we want to do well as a coaching team? I think that's a powerful question. You can have anything you want, but you can't have everything. So what do we need to do well? How can we operate? How can we contribute? And I'll show you some little answers here. What is success? How do we know it? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Yeah, what does it sound like? What's the big picture? How do we want them to feel in the environment? Now I work in the background with some elite coaches, elite level coaches. And I say, how do you want them to feel driving the training, that feeling, the human spirit, the human spirit. We can never dehumanize a learning environment. Force performance. You get what they call an overreaction, underreaction, because you disconnect people from themselves. What type of person, player, and team do you want to produce? And then this is your soccer stuff. What are the key skills and principles, the game model, you might call it, whatever. And what this is a really important block. What is exceptional, acceptable, and unacceptable behavior look for, for our coaching teams? People don't listen, they observe over time. I know that for sure. So this is the questions and this is some of the answers that my coaching team, we, we have about eight or nine in my coaching team, largely dads who help out and stuff like that. So this is what we wanted to do well last year, okay? We wanted to socialize the group, create a unity or a friendship and a psychological safety so people can come as whole and give that wholeness of person Google did research on their highest performing teams and psychological safety is a huge thing. Create an environment where people can be themselves, express themselves, play hard, fast and aggressive. We wanted to build good character and learning skills and that's why last year we put in the building blocks, the foundation stones, teach it, character and learning skills, and use words and challenges. We wanted our game, our game is hurling. So we wanted to coach it really well to the individual. Coach the individual, the team will be fine. We wanted to challenge them respectfully. There were four things. This is how we thought we'd operate. I would be the head coach. This guy is really important. Admin, parental communications, all that detail. The devil is always in the detail. We had a couple of guys who helped out with individual coaching, one-to-one -one coaching and different, different things. Looks very complex, but in fact, it's really simple. Get good people and ask them, can they do jobs? This is how we would measure success. Recruitment. Now, we can't recruit. We can only get who's, hit, who's there. So they come, they stay, and they say thanks. That's how we know it's good. They come, they stay, they say thanks. I came across that phrase, development at all costs. And I thought it was a powerful phrase. That's what we're striving towards, development at all costs. That would be huge success. That would be the big picture. We cannot rush the performance. But from this emerges surprisingly good performance. So this little question, how do you want them to feel? Like they belong, like they loved it, like they're learning, like they've been challenged. So, And then this was probably you know, a thing that we put an awful lot of time into. And I think everybody should put a lot of time into it. What would exceptional look like from a coaching team? Imagine down here on part two, if we had specific individual feedback, it would be exceptional. If we were given generic, it'd be fine, but if it was useless or no feedback, not great. Down the bottom, if we could lead them to love it, wouldn't it be exceptional? If we made it enjoyable, it'd be fine. If it wasn't fun or enjoyable, it'd be no good. If we love them, it'll be great. If we treated them well, it'll be fine. But if, if you know if there was abuse or anything like that, not cool. So this is a clear mirror of what we would hope it looked like. Then the player we want, this is my one anyways, 
Bruce Lee be water, highly adaptable player. And we talk about the awarenesses of the player. Yeah. Self-aware. And we look at this as we go along. The team. I use your great country as, an, as a, whatever they call an acronym for a team. USA, united. Ferocious togetherness. Strong, physically, mentally, tactically, technically, and adaptable, which means we can play whatever way we want to play. So that's the team we look for. And then we want them to play the game in the emotive state of, of, of bravery and courage and love, and the absence of fear. So that's the emotive state we want the team in. And then we need to drill down into what are the focus skills of the principles of the game model and how will we coach them. And I'm going to leave that to you. That's your game. So that was the fourth one, that coaching connection. That building a coaching team, that clarity, the questions. Bruce Suckman talked about forming, coming together, storming, uh, asking a lot of questions and not knowing where we're going. And then norming, getting standards and then performing. So that coach connection is everything. And using tools, questionnaires and facilitation. So I would facilitate an awful lot of that in management. And then once you get that simplicity, then we yield complexity from there. We do the simple things, make everything as simple as possible. What should it look like? How do we want them to feel like they love it? Yeah. What's exceptional? We coach the individual. Pretty simple. Then we need individual coaches to help. Now we can run the session, but we can bring out people for five minutes if the structure delivers the function. And then the final connection, and connection is the biggest element of this really, so I should have warned you before that, is connecting the team and the players and the coaching team to parents in sport. And that's an important part of it, I, I fundamentally believe. So again, head coach can't do everything. So you will have um, hopefully an administrator uh, like mine. We have Mike Hannon, he, he does everything for me. So he would do little summaries, sorry, we're going to, uh, little summaries of everything we're doing and how's it working, and what's happening. And then also my players will present and this back projects that they've worked on back to their parents um, and our five values of a team so that there's great clarity. And I find when people understand what it's about and the attention to detail that's there, they gen gen generally support, support. So that connecting back to parents, show them the coaching charter, show them the player charter. That's really important. So there are five connections that I think a coach should make in summary, connect to the player. Whatever way you do it, do it consistently and do it strategically and do it intentionally. People like to be treated as individuals. I know that for sure. Connect the players to each other. Unity. Connect them to the game, the future in the game, the club. Connect with your coaches and then connect to the parent. And then we drive it on then again. So this is awareness. Said Gak Tolle wrote a book called The New Earth. And he said, the greatest agent for change, uh, uh, awareness is the greatest agent for change. There's a Malawan or Malayan saying, I, I don't know which to pronounce it, says, if you don't know what you don't know, then you can't know. But what you, if you do know what you don't know, then you may know. So awareness, how can we drive awareness? Now, for me and a coach, there are three awarenesses, okay? Power, potential, and scope of coaching. How well it can be done. If you don't know what you don't know, then you, you won't know. But coaching changes people's lives. I got off a call oh, a month ago and I had that talked about that. And a guy rang me a minute after the call and he was pretty much crying. And he said, a coach saved my life. So the power and potential and scope for coaching. Coaching is the way out of this pandemic um, for kids. It's the way out of the problem. What did, what's the latest study said we're going to lose 40% uh, to sport from the pandemic if we don't change the environments or improve it. I have said in the regional, the biggest hospital in Ireland on obesity and mental health um, task force. And I talked to them about coaching and saying, this is the solution for everything. The power and potential and scope for good coaching is amazing of it. Second awareness I think we have to have as coaches is the holistic nature of coaching. So the skills we teach in, in sport are transferable. 
we have a player and we have a person and we develop both sides through both sides and from that they have the the personal character qualities and the performance character qualities and from that we get a better player long term the best is yet to come we're only really learning about coaching sports science and all that and all that now so the pressures that coaching will be putting on the player because more information we have now is going to require way more of the player yeah so they're going to be need to really need to be developed in a lot of areas because in a kind of ironic way, the pressure that will be coming on from sports science and uh, performance analysis. So the player has to be really, the foundations have to be really, really deep and, and, and coaching needs to develop them learning skills. And coaches need to be aware of that. And then I think the final awareness of a coach is to be self-aware, yeah? And, and that can be hard. Again, questions are the answers. So simple questions. I don't think you necessarily need to accumulate more information. It's about contemplation and discerning information and making it what I know for sure. So these would be the questions. Again, we have tools here, questions. Why do you coach? So the reason I coach is to make where I'm from a great place to play hurling. Why do you coach the way you do? How informed are we? Can we justify it? It's fine. How does it feel to be coached by you? that feeling, that emotive peace is massive. That can be a hard question because some days it feels crap to be coached by me. When my ego gets in my way and I, re and I forget that my legacy will be measured by how I served others, I'm here to serve. How do you treat the weakest in the group? And I think that's, I'm learning more and more that that's the, that's the magic one. We can create an environment to treat and challenge everybody, the weakest and the strongest, and they provide you know, a real place where effort is acknowledged and the currency is effort. So it doesn't matter how talented you are because it's the greatest enemy of, of, of excellence. So we really challenge the weakest. We provide a real environment for everybody. And I think that the better, more talented players are better because of that. If we're elitist and we rush to performance and we praise talent and all that, we're going to get a, a kind of a fixed mindset, you know, to X stuff. What do you want them to say about you in 20 years time? What are you strong at? What are you weak at? And what limits you? Influence is everything. People don't listen. They observe over time. So that's a little joke for you there. But the best form leadership principle is a monkey see, monkey do. So the team over time will be an extension of the coach. So that self-awareness piece is massive. Now we go on to the three awarenesses of the player. So we've gone through connection and awareness of the coach. This is the aware, awareness of the player. So the type of player we want at the end of this is a self-aware player who says, if it is to be, it is up to me. It is my challenge. It is mine to figure out. I can provide the solutions. I can, I am, I will. A self-aware player, not a needy. Coaching creates independence, not dependence. They go to the pitch to learn to think for themselves. So little ways we can drive self-awareness and nurture it in coaching will be, you know, scenario-based or problem-based sessions. Here's the scenario, play it, figure it out, then question, yeah? Put them three, two down, put them one person sent off on a team and let them figure it all out. Create wide pitches, narrow pitches, big pitches, small pitches. Put them into different scenarios and question them. Let them play with two men more, two men less. Two minutes, two minutes to go, two, two nil down, figure it out. And then review it. So an awful lot of that and captain's challenges. I would have everyone at the players having a, a kind of a, a, a simple tool from my route to performance. So they understand their own performance and what they need to do well. So their performance goals, I don't know them for soccer and I'm not even going to try. But what would good performance look like? So in my, in my, in my sport, in a position to hit the ball 12 times might be good. In the game to do that, I might have to go wide and deep and create a clear line of passing. And before training and after, so training preparation, I would practice my striking and practice talking to my teammates about the lines and all that. So a clear route to performance, that's a tool for the player and it drives self-awareness. 
And then I think a huge thing that drives self-awareness is coaching the individual and getting them, helping them to understand themselves. Simple concept from Andy Friend. He's a rugby coach, a Connacht rugby coach in Ireland. He's an Australian guy. He talks about weapons and work-ons and all these players have weapons, things they're really, really good at and work-ons, things they're working on. So when they go out to the individual coach, they go, I'm working on this, let's work on it. Dry self-awareness. Before a game, you'll tell me, what's your, work, what's your weapon? weapons? They might go, well, my speed and my concentration be world-class at that. Drive their self-awareness of what they're really good at and, 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 and let them know what they need to work on and then support them in that. Second awareness of the player is of game, understanding the principles of the game. Yeah, the skills of the game, the principles, the systems, understanding the game model. That's really important. Students of the game, let them watch the game. Give them challenges to watch the game and mark it at certain levels. Get them to learn the game, know their position. What are the best players doing in the game? And the final awareness we want is in-game awareness, decision-making under pressure, yeah? Now, the better their self-awareness and the better their off-game awareness, the better that will lead and help to lead to in-game awareness. But things like games-based approach or constraints-led approach to coaching drive that problem solving. So in a simple word, training should look a bit like the game. And obviously there's a continuum. And obviously you, you probably know all that. I'm not here to, to teach you about coaching soccer, but that's the awareness we want. Playing the game fast and aggressive under pressure. So they're the three awarenesses I want in a player. The next element of the, of, of the framework is, is research. And it's not really it's not really heavy research, it's just you know it's stuff you need to know. So you need to know, they say if you want to teach Latin to Johnny, you have to know Latin and you have to know Johnny. So knowing the player, knowing the game, and knowing learning. And then let what you know drive then what you do. So after this, I might take a little break if, if, if it works well for you. I might give everyone a chance just to reinvigorate. But uh, I'm just going to fly through research and then effectively we're, 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 on a, we're on our home then really. So I think you've got to understand, you know, the needs of a player, the human needs. And again, we go to feeding the needs and we go to Maslow. And that's the, the environment must feed the needs of the player. Longing, belonging, joy, all these needs. And then if we look at self-determination theory, they need you know, autonomy, be able to make their own decisions, have their own inputs. They need competence. So they need to you know, be challenged appropriately. And the challenge needs to be at the right level so that they can get competence at what they're doing, which drive confidence and contribution. And then they need to feel related. So they need to feel connected to the place. And if we get them things, we will get contribution. So just looking at the environment and seeing, is it feeding the needs of the player? And from that will emerge an awful lot of good things. I think you need to know the, the characteristics of the player. So the, you know, the performance versus the potential. You could have a 12 year old who might be performing really high but a lot of their, they might be practicing at home all the time. They might have 10 brothers at home. They might be tripping over balls. They might be maxed out. You could have a 12 year old who's performing very averagely, but they might be living in a flat that's eight stories high and then they mightn't have any brothers and they might never go down and play. So their potential might be massive. So knowing the player and what might be in the player is really important. The characteristics, the qualities of the player what is left inside, what is untapped, what has been tapped. I think you really need to know the player there. I think, I think you need to know that the law of consistency, I, I always go back to that one. You know, if we want effort, we want people who can apply themselves at high level long-term, we need to design environments that create that demand all the time and that acknowledge that demand and be consistent in it all the time. And from that simplicity, we will get an awful lot of things. I know I need, I think we need to know the role of mistakes in learning and the learner needs to be taught that as well. Do we want to look good or do we want to learn? 
So what we learn to do, we learn by doing badly first. And when we put out new stuff in front of the players, they need to know this will look bad before it looks good. I'm a big believer in that. Teaching the learner about learning and, and the tripping leads to the walking, as I would say. And I think the coach needs to know that. And the player needs to teach that to the player or she. And then finally, what we really need to know is a bit about the pillars of the player. And I'm sure, look, I'm confident we all know these this stuff, you know, but there is um there is a bit to know on this, and there might be a bit of specialism in it. But in general, the physical qualities. Sport is about making shapes and changing shapes, producing and reducing force. And the games are getting faster all the time. So Bill Knowles, a mentor of mine and maybe physical prep, talks about the dollar a day. Yeah, putting a physical section. I think he's Philadelphia Union, isn't he? Putting a physical section into every training session and putting that dollar a day from child to champion. So what does he look like or she look like at the very, very end? And how can we put in a dollar every day that will get us there? The technical skills, tactical skills, team play, mental skills. That mental skills, I think, is, I genuinely think it's going to be the next level of, of, of coaching. What are the skills around concentration, application, intention, arousal, regulation, yeah, visualization. I think that's where we're really going to be going as coaches, tapping into that and understanding them skills that the players will need. And then obviously teaching lifestyle skills. What's the poem? There is a choice you have to make in everything you do. So keep in mind that in the end, the choice you make makes you. So they have to understand that lifestyle and that needs to be taught. So there needs to be assistance there. Habit formation, journaling, stuff like that, living it with intention. So there's huge scope to support. I wrote a book for teenagers called Be the Best You Can Be in Sport. And uh, I fundamentally believe it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's a very solid um, resource for any player. But the development we can, the scope for development of the player is massive. And it's, 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 it's all them pillars. There's no point building up the technical one and the mental skills aren't there. I was on the sideline um, this year, last year, in, in, at an adult. I coach an adult as well, or help out coaching. And um, the player said to me, before the game, my legs feel awful heavy. I don't think it's going to be a good day today. And I knew straight away he was in trouble. He hadn't the mental skills to shift. He hadn't the skills. They weren't there. They weren't nurtured. But all them pillars will be underpinned by value character and behaviours. That's what will create the platform from which we drive up and ultimately then we will get performance. So we want the player to be well developed in all. They could be higher in certain pillars than others, but we want them well developed across as many as possible. And the mental skills, it's not that complex. The mental skills, there's a, five or six mental skills that can be taught quite simply. Now, obviously, the sports psychologists and all that, and I'm not getting in their way or anything, saying their job is easy, but, you know, there's definitely stuff we can do there. Now, we're more than halfway there. Benjamin, will we take a break or a couple of minutes, three minutes, Ben, what do you reckon? Here, sure, you... let's do a three-minute break. Three-minute break. And we'll Start in the clock. Grab a coffee, water. A Blue whiskey? Coffee. Yeah, whiskey. You're in Whatever. Ireland? Yeah, big time, lads. Thank you. How am I going, Chief? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, enjoying it. I've got pages of notes and uh, questions. Mm -hmm. oh, Jesus. I'm trying to answer. Yeah. You you will uh, you will call this Ben when when we're ready to go again yeah sure go Matt got a watch going.
Okay, 30 seconds. I come from a long line of town criers going back yeah. into the Middle Ages, so I can yeah. bring a group together pretty well. Cool man. Yeah. 10 seconds. Tension getters. <laughs> or so I might tell some after a beer or two. All right, let's go. Cool. Thanks. I hope you relaxed there a bit and uh, got a break. I know this, uh, I give a lot, but um, for someone like me that is passionate about coaching, I believe it's, a, it's important to give a lot. I think sometimes we oversimplify coaching and, uh, and the, although there's a simple practice. So look at, we, we, we look at values and visions now. So we've gone with connection, awareness, research. When I get to the end of the, the visions, it should start tying in and the whole thing should start making you know, a kind of a nice little uh, toolkit for, for a coach or, or something comprehensive. Um, the devil is in the detail. I, I, I always believe that. Um, I don't know, do you, do you have to read Hamlet in, in school? But um, Laerte said to Polonius, you know, it's about values, he said, um, this above all else to thy own self be true. The sure as night must follow day, it cannot do wrong to any man. And I'm going to introduce you to a coach, an Irish coach called Jim Gavin. I won't have a picture of him, but I'll show you what he said before he took his job. And the words he used, the clarity he had, the intentionality he brought. And I suppose ultimately he was the winningest football coach ever in, in, in Irish Gaelic games. They won uh, five in a row, six, went on to win six in a row after him. And are still champs, Dublin uh, Gaelic football. Uh, he had a military background and... Um, he was a, a really interesting coach. And this is what he said before he took the job. He said, my goal is to create a team which is imbued with an ethic which puts winning for the team and the county ahead of individual glory and a team that will accept patterns of play and tactics which are designed to support the team rather than inconvenience the player and to build a team that has a strong awareness of traditions and values of Dublin football. So words create images. His first sentence, he uses the word team five times. He said, the goal is to create an environment within Dublin football where I can get the best players. We will create an environment that will attract them. So we'll have all soccer, rugby, everything else will be going on, but we will create this environment where we will attract the best players. And I get that group of players that will have an ethos of hard work, commitments and sacrifice that we can drive and get a consistent performance from these players. And if we do that, I'm sure the results will follow. The winningest team ever, I'm sure the results will follow. He said, I see teams that play with humility and I expect that from them. Now, monkey see, monkey do, he was an incredibly humble person. I expect a disciplined approach, but on and off the field. And I expect the players will play with passion, but discipline and respect for officials and I expect him to go out there and express himself. So before he took the job, he was really clear. Like Phil, um, Steve Kerr, 18 months building his coaching world before he went with the Golden State Warriors. A real clarity. And as with everything, the devil is in the detail. So now we just looked at to values. And values live, lived out become, you know, character qualities, really. I do a lot with players around their own personal values and... Uh, character qualities the one but values of a coach and we, we've, we've learned an awful lot about this there's a lot of research into this and um, Brené Brown Hirons all this stuff these are mine uh, pretty simple I like to simplify everything mine are ref and uh, they spell ref uh, the first one is respect respect of others creates a spirit of loyalty followers are motivated to take hardship and glorious sacrifice in the attainments of goals the Chinese book of changes respect the game each other teach respect e for me is effort effort is the currency in the heartbeat of achievement judge effort first and then f is fun so the fun man amanda visek there she did research on fun enjoy and there's 81 things that were fun and they were broken into 11 different areas now blue red and yellow are the primary colors if i get them three things right I can have any color I want. From that simplicity, I will yield complexity if I understand it and I can deliver consistently. So I think 
and it's nothing new. We've heard it a million times. Keep the most important things the most important things. So these are the visions. And by the time I come to the end of this list, we'll, uh, we'll have an idea how the, how the coaching world is built and tighter. So a vision for yourself as coach, mine is quite simple. I want to be deeply connected to the player. I want them to know that I'm trustworthy and believable and that I'm there for the right reason. So that's my vision for myself is connected. And I wrote a book about this and it's just full of questions. A vision for success. We said, I had it already. They come, they stay, they say thanks. Good coaching gives everyone a chance. So that's success. If they come, if they stay, if they say thanks. If they're not saying thanks and they're walking out of there, they're not acknowledging that they're getting anything. If they don't acknowledge that they're getting something, eventually it'll die. Everyone must say thanks. For winning, I use the poem, uh, the road ahead or the road behind. And there is a line and it says, for who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? Because giving all, it seems to me, is not so far from victory. So that is the vision for winning. Giving all within his span. The coaching team. I want a coaching team that is connected, that is competent, and that they care and they all contribute. That's the way that the four C's of the coaching team I talk about. Competent, connected, they care, and they all contribute. Now the environment in which we work within and the questions and the clarity and from that, that process, the detail, that's the coaching team I want. The vision for the person and the player. The player we talked about already for me is water. That's the vision for my player. Flow and crash, ebb, yeah. The vision for the team is, I told you already, is USA, united, strong and adaptable. Unity, psychological safety, togetherness. Strong in the pillars, mental skills, physical skills, technical, tactical and lifestyle skills. And adaptable, which means if you want to be nice, we can play nice. And if you want to be horrible, we, we can play that way too. So whichever way you want to play it, adaptability. The Darwin said it's not the strongest to survive, but it's the most adaptable to change. So a vision for how the game should be played. This is dovetail back into the coaching stuff, the connection and coaching team, I told you. Joy, passion, courage, the absence of fear. That's how I want the play game to be played. In the style of play or the game model. So we have our own style of play game model. You will have that. So these are all visions that every, the coach needs to develop. The coaching model. So we have our coaching model is quite simple. The head coach runs sessions. We have individual coach helping out and stuff like that. Players go in and out and they get individual work-ons and that kind of stuff. And then all of that of what I've done so far leads us to be able to, the coach to design a session. So the vision for the session. Because I, I, I fundamentally believe that what you do must be a product of your own conclusions. And we talk about authenticity in coaching. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's, that's, that's the, real, the real deal in coaching. Build your world from real clarity. And that drives very simple actions. So I think a session needs to be organized. It needs to be enjoyable. There needs to be learning, competitiveness, and conditioning. So this is how I create a session plan. At the top, I, have a, I create a template that doesn't change. It's my coaching world. And from that, then I plan work. So this is what the top of the session plan looks like. Why am I there? I'm there to make where I'm from a great place to play. What do I value? Respect, effort, and fun. Vision for myself, connected, the player, water, the team, USA, the style of play. We talk about a direct style of play in us. Different visions, the coaching team, CCC. These words create images. So build that really clear and that stays there. Age-related stuff stays there. If I have 12 years old, if I have 15 years old, what can I expect from them? Who is Johnny? Who is Mary? And then the game model, skills, principles, systems. So the template for coaching session is built through building the world. And then it's about consistency and then it's about planning. And from that, I create content around pillars. And that's simple. So you build the world 
and then that stays there as, as the focus from which we work. So the session, the subsections of the so the session is broken into five elements. So each subcategory or whatever it is, we use a thing in, 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 in teaching called we are learning to. So if we talk about, we've only four skills that we work on in our game, you'll have a lot more, I'm sure. Tackling is one. So we are working today on tackling. It is one of our four core skills. The more and better we are at getting the ball, or tackling, the better we are at getting the ball back so we can attack. So we put everything in context. We are learning to quickly. You tell the, you tell the player, this is what we're learning. This is why. When they understand why, they apply themselves at a higher level. What I'm looking for, WILF, is another teaching acronym we use. This is exactly what I'm looking for in a tackle. I'm looking for your body, body shape, shuffle and pivot, head position, different things. I don't know what you look for. So the key coaching points in the cues. Why we're doing what I'm looking for, then questions, you know, why did you turn that way? How did your body feel in that? Blah, blah, blah. And then I will use constraints. If it's tackling, we might have a wider pitch, narrower pitch, different types of numbers. We might score stuff and everything. So we look at, we use the game model to pull out, to put in. We understand our values, our visions, all that stuff, what I'm looking for, really simple stuff. And then we might use timings or rituals or routines to drive application. So we might say, okay, we're gonna do play at this level for three minutes, so I want you at nine out of 10 not you know we're going to play and you can tune in whenever you like routines or rituals like counting back from five four three two one everybody at 100 percent, all that stuff simple stuff to drive application intention to create intensity in what we're doing and clarity clarity drives action and um, so that, that's how i design a session just it's a product of what i've learned to be true doesn't really bother me what anyone else thinks. Um, the, I, I built it with care and, and that's what I'm gonna work on. So this brings us to the E, things that get recognized and rewarded gets repeated. So endorsing is the language of coaching for me or noticing, noticing what's happening around us. Things that get recognized gets repeated. So um, I wanna tell you a story. There was a thing in your brain, some of you will know more about this than me, I'm sure, called a reticular activating system, which is a filter for how we see the world. I'm sitting in my house and outside my house there is a front wall. My home house where I grew up is about three miles down the road. When I was 32 years old, I'm now 38, I built my house and I had to put a, a wall at the front of the house. So I had lived close to my own, or in my home or around it, my home house for 32 years and I'd never seen a wall in 32 years. But now I'm building my own house and I need to build a wall. So now I start noticing everybody's wall. I spent an awful lot of my life looking out at a neighbor's wall and I never even seen it. What height was it? What was the stonework? Was there a joint? Was there no joint? Was there a, an in or an out? Was it straight? The reason I'm seeing walls now at 32, I've never seen them before and noticing is because my reticular activating system has acted like a funnel to bring forward what is important to me at this stage in my life. So it is my premise that unless you have taken the time and attention and, and care to build a coaching world, you, you won't, all this stuff will be happening around you, but you won't be able to tune into it and see it. Yeah? Because we do not see things as they are, we see them as we are. So if we have taken the time to build a coaching world, we will be able to notice things. Great body shape, well done. We can be very specific, good vision, good decision, excellent sportsmanship. So we can literally endorse all the good little things. So our coaching becomes, our coaching becomes kind of indirect by what's happening around us. I love the way, you know, you change your body shape before you took the shot. Not great goal. So you're seeing the detail and you're just feeding, feeding it back. You're recognizing it in the player. So your feedback becomes very, very specific by what's happening around you. But it is because you know exactly the detail, what you're looking for. And that's an excellent effort. Yeah, not just 
great job or whatever. Yeah. Because they say for to be effective, feedback needs to be clear. So if we talk about tackling great body shape, yeah, it needs to be perfect, uh, purposeful. Great body shape, body shape is key in tackling, meaningful, great body shape, compatible to the student's prior knowledge. Body shape and shuffle and pivot are critical in, 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 in tackling and to provide a logical connection. Tackling is one of our four score skills. If we tackle well, we get the ball back. So your endorsing philosophy drives the application by recognizing what's happening around you all the time and by not being, it's kind of like specificity in praise. So your narrative turns into something that's very articulate and very noticing and you're micro dosing feedback all the time. And I think it's a, it's a very simple concept to put into your coaching. Then the R is reflection. And we've heard about all this before. So the coach post session, I think tools again are important. If you've built a world in the simple things you want to stand for, a 10 out of 10 can be a very simple one, right? Did you enjoy it? Were you true to your values? Respect, effort and fun, whatever you're into, yeah? Did you connect with the players if that's important to you? You build this tool to your own liking. Did you raise awareness? What's important now? Getting better at getting better, the cycle of improvement. The expert knows what's not important and they learn that through a process. I think reflection and the player is really important to drive the self-awareness. And again, tools, different tools. You know, the, the crass person has tools for every job. This is a generic tool that I might use an odd time. We use it all the time, it becomes boring and stale. But we might give them a questionnaire after training or after a game, did you enjoy it? We talk about savagery because our game is quite aggressive. Where were you on that? Where are you on skill execution? Consistency. I look the same all throughout. So we have 60 minutes and we talk about 60 pictures. If I took 60 pictures of you across 60 minutes, would you look relatively the same? Chin up, chest out, ready, prepared for battle, ready for war, whatever you're into. So that consistency. So that tool for the player to reflect, but it can be simpler, it can be more complex, it can be whatever you want. The team, we sit and we reflect and we go back to what we said we want it to be. And are we just full of crap or are we, you know, being true? Are we learning? So that that checkpoint there always for the team. Sport is a learning competition. It's about getting better at getting better and teaching that process, them skills of learning is the job of the coach. The best is yet to come. And then as a coaching team and as a club, we go back over our little charter as a coaching team, where we are on our exceptional, acceptable and unacceptable. And we work really hard on that be little care. So for me, the, the cycle of coaching improvement has to be, start here. It must start with building the world. And from that, then the, the work is planned. It is, a, you know, a byproduct of what you think is important or what I, so then you work the plan, you know all this, yeah, you feed forward what's important now and you keep refining. The thing about coaching is there's no end to it. It's about pulling back what's not important. It's about carving, it's about what do I not need, yeah? And then seeing what's there, the expert knows what's not important. The coach needs tools and skills. The good craftsperson person is a tool for every job. My father was a carpenter, yeah? One of the last things he ever says to me before he died of mesothelioma, which would eventually kill him, his craft. He said, when I go, don't give my tools to anyone. His tools were everything. Coaching is a craft. Now, this is a place I do an awful lot of work in um, uh, clubs, bringing people together in clubs and trying to get them to row in the same direction and feed the bigger picture and, and, and create a kind of a, an environment where a coach can, can thrive. I think the model of coach development where people go away, do a course, and come back into the club is, is pretty flawed, in my opinion. I think the only place to learn good coaching is in your club, in an environment that understands good coaching. And uh, that's where I work an awful lot with, with clubs, creating learning environments for clubs, for coaches, 
So create an environment where, where a coach can really thrive. So a lot of clubs and organizations, you know, people are going in different directions. They, they, you know, it, it, it's hard to figure it out. And I suppose what we're looking is to create a rhythm where we row together, pull together, use our strengths, harness it. And I always put up that image of the F1 team, you know, plugging into the player, you know, everyone doing the role. And, and uh, you know, I always say, you know, it's not a presentation without Ali. But I know the truth. I know where I'm going. You don't have to be what you want me to be. I'm free to be what I want. So all clubs and organizations are free to be what they want. Yeah, there's a choice, but it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. So we go to here, you know, this, this famous stuff. Yeah. So this is, where, again, this is, I, I spend a lot, a lot of time in this space for clubs. So we're trying to create conditions for coaching success. And these are the principles that I would use a, a, in a club. So I think you start with the end in sight. What should it look like? Shared, establishing a shared purpose, shared values and shared visions. And that probably looks like small group activities. I do this, uh, I do it virtually now chat rooms, people talking about what's our purpose, what does a good coach look like, what does the player look like, what's the experience for the player like, what's exceptional for a coaching team. So we ask all them questions into different groups and you might pull out something like that. So this is a question there of a club I was working with. What's the purpose of the club? I think they had eight into 70 something on a call from a club. So we see here the common threats that are on about community, social, friendship, that. They're on about development. Everyone talks the same things, yeah? So then we wash it down into something. So we do that across, you know, 10, 15 talking points and that creates a, a frame. So establish that. One thing I always say is don't, it comes from teaching, they say don't test people before you teach them. Bring everyone with you. Try and bring everyone with you in a club, that's important. So then to create this real tangible understanding that we pride ourselves in coaching and appreciation of that. We pride ourselves in coaching. Once we get coaching right, everyone gets a chance. So really that tangible thing and that, that kind of reinventing the organization around coaching. And then I think a lot of you will probably have this going already with centralizing information, you know, and really swelling resources and creating, I suppose, from that a kind of a curriculum. But it can't be top down or it can't be imposed from governing bodies. I think these need to be created. And I use your, your lovely statement of the people, for the people and by the people. And that's what I do in clubs is help them create their own document, their own that's unique to them. Yeah, build their own club, their own world. Once you get that manual or that centralized thing, it is in charge. It is in charge. And the egos go out the window. A good coach looks like this. 85 people said it looks like this. This is what they do. A good coaching team. This is what we're working towards. Then you get a committee that kind of see through that. Then you implement reviews, microdose coach support, microdose it really important the process bang 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 and from that then you you utilize expertise all too often we bring in experts in different areas and the environment isn't there for them to really apply themselves you utilize expertise and you know the specifics of game coaching or whatever and then the philosophy is just getting better and now you always say the devil is in the detail and the mastery is in the process the skill skill is in the delivery so that's why sometimes it can be helpful to get people in to deliver and, and work on all this stuff. So I'm gonna end now, this is the final thing. This was given to me by Andy, friend. It's a poem. I like poems, words are important. What is it all about? And I'm gonna read it and I hope you enjoy it. So tomorrow morning, my son or daughter starts football. They're gonna step out onto a field and a great adventure that will probably include joys and disappointments will begin. Imagine they're going to lose. Huh? 
So I want you to take them by the young hand and teach them what they will need to know. Teach them to respect the referee because his judgment is final. If he doesn't respect the referee, there'll always be someone to blame. There'll always be an out. Teach him not to hate his competitors, but to admire their skills. Hatred isn't the answer. Love is the answer. Teach him to play as part of a team, but never be selfish. He can be motivated by self-interest, or she can, but they still have team interest. Teach him never to blame his teammates if the team is losing. No anger, blame and complain. Teach him that winning isn't everything, but by God, trying to win is competition ferocious competitors teach them that it's far more honorable to lose than it is to cheat they get into the habit of cheating they will always try and find the easy way out teach them to be a competitor how does he learn that by the opportunity create a competitive environment teach him to close his ears to the howling mob and to stand up for himself if he thinks he is right again this could be he or she i missed uh, I missed that. I let my team down one day when I thought we were badly treated. I think we should have walked off. We didn't do that. That's fine. This is important. Teach them gently, but don't coddle them because only the test of fire, oopsie daisy. Only the test of fire makes fine steel. Must be at the right temperature, yeah? The fire. This is a big order, coach. I place a son or daughter into your hands. See what you can do for him because he's a great fella. His mom or his dad. Fella is, is a word for boy or girl. So that's what it's all about for me. I think that's a pretty simple um, poem that sums it up all really clear and brings it home. So my lovely lady, his name is Lauren, and she is from Houston, the home of the Space Cadet. And uh, coaching is not easy. Um, it, it's a challenge. Um, and it'll measure the best of your energies and skills, and I, 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 I wish you had. That's that's my framework there, and um, I hope it's there's something in it for you. And I thank you for you know, give me the chance to present it to you. And um, coaching, in summary, is about getting the best out of people, and it's about developing skills and tools that will allow you to do that. And there's elements or principles or keys to, to that, and um, I hope that helps um, helps you. Um, you get me there and all these places. That's a website. Um, you know yourself, you know me, whatever. There's books there, whatever. If you have questions, and if I'm able to answer them, I'll try. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you I don't know. And uh, you might work from there. But I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going nowhere, so I'll be here. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start to bring questions that have come up. Um, somebody asked, what is the said principle? Said principle is, 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 a, is, a, is a physical principle, which is specific adaptation to impose demands, which states you will get a specific adaptation to the demands you impose consistently. So they would say that if you lift a weight consistently, your arm will get bigger. So I use that principle, I hijack that principle as saying, well, what do I want in the players and how can I create an environment that will create that specific adaptation by the demands that I impose consistently? So um, one, of, one of the first principles of our game, my game anyways, is you've got to win your own individual battle. So uh, the Roman Empire was built, the first modality of training was one-to-one -one combat. So we put in that an awful lot. And from that, we get a ferocious sporting competitor. That's the adaptation we get, yeah? We play a team sport, but our first principle of gaining possession is win your own battle first. And uh, I use that as the law of consistency, understanding what is the adaptation I want and what is the demands I must impose. Yeah. Okay. Great. Hey, uh, many of the people on here looking at the um, uh, the list here are directors. Um, I uh, have a question on how do you uh, how you talk about dealing with the player? They have to have an interest level in becoming a better player. If they're at a five or below, you say, okay, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, but if someone's at a six or a seven, you can help them improve in their interest level. How about that is with coaches? 
Um, is that, should that be the first step is that a coach has a desire to work in a more, co more coherent, coherent manner? Yeah. So, so like, I, 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 I understand this quite, I understand this challenge because, um, you know, it, it's, it's, so every club is different. They have a different IQ, different acumen and um, different cultures. And it's all about relative improvement. You know what I mean? So continuous improvement. So um, I've worked in clubs that have high IQ and it's the challenge is the same, get better. So it's all relative. So I suppose it's how can we create an environment that will uh, drive self-want or self-improvement in a coach is, is really it. And it's utilizing the expertise and getting in people. And uh, sometimes you have to last lead as a le leader and you have to lift it. I would have, we created a child section in our club called the Little Reds. Uh, we created a, what we called a Little Red Code. We put an awful lot of work into it, sold our message very, very hard, drove coach recruitment, um, just were relentless in our pursuit of trying to engage um, and just trying to, mastery was in that process of continuous improvement incrementalism i said uh, incrementalism can lead to a revolution so that's what we were trying to do it's just being relentless in that change and again we're always looking to stimulate it so the coach of the coaches needs to drive a want for self-improvement and it's a simple principle whether it's in the player yeah. or the coach you know so it starts with the club uh, identifying that they want to embark upon this uh, concentration on honing in on their vision, on their values, on their uh, philosophy around all of these areas, and then uh, create the situation for coaches to uh, thrive or be inspired and then thrive in this? Yeah, and I think the people have to be involved in that process of creating all that. They need to feel like they've been given an input. You know, yeah. I think if you get 80 people into a room and you say, what does a good coach look like? There is, they're all come up with the same ideas, you know? And then I think you have to, you know, you, you have to then come up with a process which will drive improvement in them, relative improvement. Like you're not going to change the world. It's just relative yeah. improvement. It's like a team. It's the same thing. Now you can have phases of shifts. Now there's loads of different things we can organize to stimulate, stimulate yeah. growth in coaches, you know? Yeah. Okay. You said ultimately coaching is taking people out of their comfort zone. Mm. Yeah, um, can all, you explain? Yeah, well, all human development happens, you know, out of the comfort zone, you know, so as often as possible, you know, on the limit, application, intention, you know, and uh, just driving that, that ability to apply yourself, you know, but, you know, we talk about deliberate practice and that kind of stuff. So I think the words we use around it is really important, you know, because that creates the mindset of challenge. So, yeah, we, 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 uh, we want them to be good. We want to challenge. We we prepare for battle, ready for war. That's uh, that's that's we're out of that comfort zone, and that's where great things happen. So then we would uh, give players like ultimately we're pre well, I'm preparing lads to play in front of ninety thousand people if they reach to the very top, and that yep. is is a huge challenge. So we need to keep pulling them out of that comfort zone. When we get the connection right and the clarity there, it's it's done in a really clear way and. Um, it's not just done in a kind of an ad hoc. And um, yeah. that's why we are learning too, and what I'm looking for and my ability to justify that then will drive application, intention, concentration. So belief in what we're doing is more important. So if they believe in what we're doing, it's actually more important than what we're doing. So yeah. a coach's ability to articulate then words, then uh, I'm a fundamental believer in that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the law of consistency. Uh, yeah. in regards to youth development yeah so we will say what type of player do we want we want we we would generally say there's two types of players learners and kind of non-learners you know so we want to learn our player so we're always we're always putting them in positions where they have to learn where there will be failure we want resilient players it comes back to the type of player you want and we're just really consistent in giving them them chances and then teaching them that this will look bad before it looks good. So that will say, for argument's sake, that um, that um, the challenge we set the players over the lockdown in teams, we didn't go near, well, we did, there were three weeks working on them projects. There was a great chance it would have been a huge failure. And um, 
at the minute now what they're doing, and there's another great chance it will be a failure too, is they are they have a, a deliberate practice challenge at the minute where they upload daily onto a Google Drive, onto an Excel. So many times we can strike the ball in six one minute blocks and there's a great chance we won't get compliance. But if we don't, at least we know what we have. So we're always on that edge of this could be, we could tip over, but that's what learning looks like. And we're willing to look bad in order to, to learn and drive it on. That's um, That would be our philosophy there. Okay, somebody just asked, can you elaborate more on the project, please? Do you have to choose one of the teams or compare those? So they so could, so. They, so, so the projects we set out, again, um, I would always like to utilize expertise. So I have a simple phrase, we set things up for success. So we got, it would be like getting your um, Premier League captain to introduce this project to our players, right? So the project was pick any team in any um, industry or sport, research their three values or what makes them, them their unique things and then compare them to our team and what we can learn from them. On average, we got slide decks with about 30 slides, high, high IQ, really interesting thing. Uh, Apple, confidentiality, uh, Tesla's um, not being afraid to take on the big dogs was one of Tesla's things. Um, yeah, so from that then, each team is, it offers two into a group and they will mash all the, the, the topics together and they will pull back five values from what we've learned from the projects and little statements around each, which we will use as our core values for the year going forward. Um, again, I would caveat that challenge with, and I was on national radio explaining that challenge, I probably did it badly there. And your man basically said to me, are you for real, this won't work. And I was there, it mightn't work, I know, but it actually did. I think we supported it really well. So we set up a huge challenge, but it was assisted well by the expertise we had in the background working with them and uh, massive learning. Um, but a really interesting one, if, if I may indulge, the, day, the night, there was two nights of presentations, right? Three teams, one night, three the other. And the first night, your man was, the first captain was to do the Golden State Warriors. And he went to share the screen, just like myself tonight, and he couldn't share it. And I went, oh, this is going to be a disaster. And I had to walk him through how to share a Zoom screen. But once he got up the PowerPoint, it was amazing. And it reminded me of a, of, of a thing I know for sure. You never know how close you are to something great if you quit. So we were so, I thought the whole thing would fall apart. We were so close when we could have said, oh, geez. we might never got over that thing. But we got through it and we got on and it was really good. So I would work a lot with teams around that kind of a cultural piece. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, I um, this has been uh, absolutely tremendous. Um, although there, here's another question. Let me do this last one. How do you deal with a child posing a question on pressure from the parents coaching on the sideline, having to listen to the coach and pleasing the parents at the same time? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, so in the coaching um, charter from the club, with clubs, we would work on a vision for the, the parent, you know, and the supporter. And uh, a beginning of year meeting will be pretty, pretty clear what we believe is exceptional, acceptable and unacceptable behavior uh, of a parent. And uh, yeah, it, it's quite, uh, when you spell it out quite simply, it's very easy to diagnose and prescribe thereafter and have context. And just say, in our club, our coaches, this is how we believe this should be done. And um, I think people, uh, when uh, when you give them that kind of coaching, coaching the parent, I think it, it helps. It helps because it gives the context for the next conversation because you can justify why this is important. And, and uh, again, you're creating a framework for the parent really. That's, that's, and that's an important element too. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much. I, in respect of everyone's time, this has been great. We've got 90 minutes. Um, so I, on behalf of NorCal and all the people that attended, I want to uh, thank you. I think that this, at this time, we have, as I told you before, uh, coming out of a unique period in human history. And we've 
firsthand seen the effects on our children and on children, uh, not just our own, and uh, the, the power that sport plays. And when um, we started to read your stuff and your podcasts, it seemed to me this is, um, you're one of the messengers of a more holistic view of coaching and of connecting one, having a club that has a vision of what they're uh, striving to achieve. And then they get their coaches to buy, help develop and buy into that vision and then improve their coach, their ability as a coach to reach every player. And um, I think it's, uh, I hope everyone found it um, very interesting as I did. And I really appreciate your time. Was my I encourage everyone, I have both books and I've had them since they arrived. I'm traveling with them and uh, reading them. So I encourage everyone to go on his website and um, I'm sure uh, you'll enjoy it. Yeah, give me a shout. Um, let me know if I can help in any way. And, and, and thanks a minute. Yeah, okay. and we'll follow up with you shortly here, Paul. Got some you, more David. questions. <laughs> That's cool. All right. That's cool. Thank, Thank you very me. much, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.